Amid the silence of the night, I, with my tired steps, reached home and involuntarily sighed. During the day, when Tina, my daughter-in-law, returned from shopping, I was there to lend a hand. She was caught up in preparing for a party at our house, and I found myself helping with an event I wasn't even going to attend. The fatigue felt double, but the thought of celebrating my granddaughter Anna's birthday and envisioning the joy of my grandson Sam as a big brother helped me get through it. As I approached the house, I noticed it was still brightly lit inside. Glancing at my watch, it was already past 9 p.m. I thought it was about time to put Sam to bed, but then I saw something unbelievable. There was Sam sitting alone in the garden, staring intently into the house. Why was he outside? Sam, what's going on? As I hurried over, Sam's face broke into a relieved smile, but then he started to cry the next moment. What's wrong? Why are you out here all by yourself? Trying to say something, Sam opened his mouth with an apologetic look. Today is Anna's birthday. I was told it's a family-only celebration and that I couldn't be part of it. That's terrible. Unable to contain myself, I grabbed Sam's arm and we started walking out of the gate. Such a thing should not be happening. You haven't eaten anything since noon, have you? I'm exhausted from work and hungry, too. Shall we go get something delicious to eat together? Saying this, I tried to cheer Sam up with my usual cheerful tone. He seemed to brighten up at my words. In the quiet of the diner at night, I left Sam at our table and stood up. Pretending to head to the self-service drink area, I sneakily pulled out my cell phone. It's been a while, but I wonder if this will connect. After several rings, Hello? A slightly puzzled voice answered. I introduced myself, apologized for calling so late at night, and succinctly explained Sam's current situation. I'll come right now. And with that, she hung up. A few minutes later, as I looked towards the entrance of the diner, a woman walked in. When I waved my hand, she hurried over to our table. Who is this person? Sam wondered as he gazed at her. She could not hold back her tears and embraced Sam. Mom, does that mean? My name is Nancy. I'm 57 years old. Currently, I live in the house my late husband left us. Our family consists of my son, his wife, and two grandchildren, making up a family of five. The story gets a bit complicated, though. My son, John, is divorced, and his current wife, Tina, is his second spouse. The elder grandchild, Sam, is from his first marriage, and there is no blood relation between Tina and the younger grandchild, Anna. It was three years ago when John brought Sam back home after his first wife's affair. At that time, Sam was struggling to adapt to his new environment and was emotionally unstable, yearning for his mother. He was only two years old then. I was taking very good care of Sam at that time. The following year, John brought home a new girlfriend. Mom, I'm going to remarry this woman. I couldn't hide my surprise at the sudden news. I thought my son was away from home due to work and other reasons, so the idea that he was doing something like this. The thought that he had been neglecting the emotionally unstable Sam to gallivant around made me so upset that I, despite being his mother, was at a loss for words. Also, she's pregnant. These words were an even bigger shock. I know this is sudden, but I hope to have your blessing. It's tough looking for a new place to live, and this house is spacious with rooms to spare, so we decided to live here. How could they be so brazen? However, knowing that Tina was carrying a child, I couldn't possibly turn them away. And so, our life together with my son, his wife, and grandchildren began. I don't know much about the former wife since she lives apart from us, 
But Tina doesn't help much with the housework. She seemed to get along well with Sam, so I thought she wasn't a bad person. However, she began to push all the housework onto me, using her pregnancy as an excuse. I worked part-time and tried to ask Tina to help with the housework. The morning sickness is terrible and I've been having abdominal pain. It's really tough. She always had some reason to refuse. I couldn't press Lish you. Although she appeared healthy, pregnancy conditions vary greatly, so I couldn't argue. It's like I'm being saddled with all the responsibility. That's how I felt, but my husband, who was always there to listen, was no longer with us. If Tina says she's having a hard time, you should be more considerate. No one accepts a harsh mother-in-law these days. Anyway, is dinner ready yet? I tried to talk to John, but he didn't take my words seriously. It's as if I'm the one who's in the wrong. Day by day, I was supporting a heavy heart as best as I could when a new ray of hope shone through. Anna, who is Sam's younger sister, was born. When Sam was born, I lived far away and couldn't visit often. But now, the baby was right here with us. I felt anew how happy that made me. Of course, it wasn't that my love for Sam had diminished. Anna's birth made me realize how fortunate I was to be able to see my grandchildren at any time. With the arrival of the new life, I saw an increased sparkle in Sam's eyes. The awareness and pride of being a big brother, the strong will to protect his little sister, I could feel it emanating from him. I made up my mind. I would raise both children with equal and deep love, without comparing their youthfulness. As I started taking care of Anna, Tina's attitude toward Sam became increasingly harsh. There might be an inevitable difference in affection between Sam, who has no blood relation to her, and Anna, whom she bore. Postpartum psychological instability might be playing a role. Even so, that's no excuse. I had to pay extra attention to how Sam was treated. I told myself to keep a watchful eye, but Tina's behavior became more extreme by the day. Sam, wanting to believe in the kindness Tina once showed him, eagerly helped with chores, trying to catch her attention. One day, after finishing my part-time job in the morning and returning home, I heard Tina's shouting so loud it carried outside the house. Sam, why can't you do something so simple? You're just making more work for me because of your mistake. It seemed Tina was scolding Sam. When I went to see what was happening, it looked like Sam had accidentally knocked over the can while making Anna's powdered milk. Sam, it's okay. Tina, he's just a child, and there's no need to be so upset. Isn't it the thought of wanting to help? That counts? I tried to calm Tina down gently, but... Nancy, this doesn't concern you, so please stay out of it. If you're going to say something, can you clean up this spilled powder milk? She was not willing to listen. I knew that a scolding from a stepmother could have an immeasurable impact on a child. Sam was holding back tears, filled with sadness, regret, and a sense of remorse. It's all right. Grandma will clean it up. You did your best, Sam. After comforting Sam with a hug, I decided to clean up the spilled powder milk on the floor. Oh, Anna, your brother is clumsy, isn't he? Such a troublesome kid. Tina glanced at us before speaking to Anna, who couldn't yet understand words, completely ignoring Sam. I struggled to contain my anger at Tina's disregard for Sam. At dinner time that night, Sam was nowhere to be seen, so I asked Tina, Where's Sam? I don't know. Maybe he went out somewhere because I scolded him earlier? That's impossible. Sam is only five years old. Where could he go? As I was thinking this, my son John came home. John, I can't find Sam. 
He's a boy, he's probably just at the nearby park or something. Anyway, Anna, daddy's home. He didn't seem worried at all. Even if he's a boy, it's past 7 p.m. Isn't it worrying that he would be at the park alone at this time? While glancing at the unconcerned pair, I hurried outside to search the neighborhood. I looked in places where Sam might be. The park, the route to the kindergarten, the supermarket we usually go to, but he was nowhere to be found. Maybe he's gone back home. Thinking this, I was about to return home when I heard a sound like metal being struck from the garden. There's a small shed in our garden. It seemed the sound was coming from that direction. Could it be that Sam is in there? No way. As I approached the shed, feeling anxious, I heard the sound of knocking and a small voice. Sam. Sam, are you in there? When I flung the door open, there was Sam, with tears in his eyes, sobbing. How could this happen again? I picked up Sam and hurried over to where I presumed John and Tina were having dinner, filled with anger. They looked at each other with displeasure upon seeing my furious face. What in the world is this about? Holding the still crying Sam, I asked them both sternly. Um, this is... I had just asked Tina but... John stumbled over his words. I gave him a stern look before Tina spoke up nonchalantly. It's Sam's fault. He ruined Anna's milk. What are these two even talking about? Locking a child in a shed over a minor mistake. How can you sit there eating peacefully knowing that? I couldn't help raising my voice. What are you saying? It was you who made him do it. Even so, this is too much. What kind of mother are you? Surprised by my anger, John tried to intervene. Let's calm down, Mom. Tina is also tired and irritated from taking care of Anna. Try to be a little more forgiving. You knew and did nothing, which is just as bad. Locking a five-year-old in such a cramped, dark place. I was so angry and disappointed that I was at a loss for words. I thought it was too much as well and tried to stop her, but... It seemed John was trying to push the blame on Tina alone. Tina glared at John in response. Instead of stopping her, you should have rescued Sam first. Are you even his father? The two fell silent, and I continued more sternly. If something like this happens again, you will both have to leave this house. But that's... John was bewildered while Tina looked down dejectedly. Thinking this warning would prevent any repeat of their actions, I focused on taking care of Sam. I bathed Sam, fed him a warm dinner, and tucked him into a cozy bed. All the while, Sam was blaming himself, trying to defend his parents. It was my fault. That's why I made Mom angry. Mom isn't bad. Dad must have been tired and hungry, too. Seeing Sam's kind-heartedness, I was determined to keep a closer watch on the two of them for his sake. Afterward, I never heard a word of apology from John or Tina, but my concerns were focused on Sam's mental and physical state. Despite the unfortunate incident, Sam continued to help out and didn't lose his smile as before. Whether it was because I was monitoring their actions or they genuinely reflected on their behavior, the harsh treatment towards Sam was no longer observed. There were times when Tina was stern with Sam, but he seemed unfazed and willingly helped out. Grandma, I'm okay. I want to help mom. Besides, Anna's cute. I have to do my best because I'm the big brother. His brave words left me speechless. I was concerned that intervening too much might upset Tina and cause Sam to suffer again. I wanted to avoid that situation at all costs. However, contrary to my concerns, John and Tina's behavior towards Sam returned to how it was before Anna's birth, and it seemed that peaceful days had returned. As time passed, I felt relieved and returned to everyday life. Two months after that tragic event, peace seemed to have finally returned. 
One day, the manager asked me to change my part-time shift due to a staff shortage in the evening until closing. Since the incident with Sam, I had been working fewer days, but being someone who finds it hard to say no, I accepted the request. Aren't you going to your part-time job today, Nancy? My shift changed today, so I start in the evening. So I'm sorry, but I'll need you to take care of dinner tonight. Tina showed a moment of displeasure, but then her expression brightened as if she had an idea. So, how about we have Anna's birthday party today? Despite knowing I would be at work, Tina suggested having the party. It seems I am not invited to the party. She doesn't seem to understand my desire to celebrate my granddaughter's first birthday together. Or perhaps she understands and deliberately chooses not to invite me. Well then, I need to start preparing for the party. I have to get John to come home early too. Oblivious to my feelings, Tina talked happily about her plans. So I'm going shopping now, please watch Anna. You can't attend the party, but at least you can do that much, right? That day, Tina left to go shopping, leaving Anna with me. It seemed to be the perfect opportunity for her to have some time for herself while I was around. No longer surprised by her selfish actions, I picked up Anna and let Tina go to the shops. That evening, after finishing a different shift at work, I headed home. During the day, after Tina had returned, I was made to help with the preparations for Anna's birthday party, which doubled my fatigue. However, thinking about celebrating Anna's special day and seeing Sam's happy face helped me keep my motivation. As I approached our house, I could see the lights inside were still brightly lit. It was already past 9 p.m., time to put Sam to bed. I just hope I don't get stuck with the cleanup. With that thought, I looked back towards the house and saw an unbelievable sight. Sam was sitting alone in the garden, staring intently into the house. I couldn't understand what had happened. I hurried towards the entrance, quickly making my way to the gate that led to the garden. Sam, what on earth happened? As I rushed over, Sam showed a relieved smile, but soon his face was wet with tears. Why are you out here all by yourself? What happened? I couldn't stop asking questions, worried, as Sam just trembled and sobbed without speaking. Shall we go inside for now? At my suggestion, Sam looked at me with surprise, hesitating to speak. Then he began to speak apologetically. Today is Anna's birthday, and I was told it's just for family, so I can't be a part of it. He spoke softly, his voice trembling. That's terrible. Instinctively, I felt anger, took Sam's hand, and started walking outside, speechless. Grandma, what's wrong? Are you angry? Where are we going? When Sam asked me anxiously, I snapped back to reality. You haven't eaten anything since lunch, have you? I'm tired today, and I'm hungry too. Let's go get something delicious to eat together. Speaking cheerfully, I focused on reassuring Sam. He responded to my voice and let out a sigh of relief. I had been worried about the looks we might receive for bringing a child to the diner at night, but the other patrons and staff seemed indifferent to us, which was a relief. Then, I stood up, leaving Sam alone at the table for a moment. I'm going to get some juice. Pretending to go to the self-service drink area, I actually took out my cell phone. I hope this call connects. It's been a while. As the phone continued to ring, someone eventually answered. Hello? A voice came through, tinged with a question. I introduced myself, apologized for calling so late, and briefly explained Sam's situation. The person on the phone. I'll come right now. Returning to our table, I saw Sam eating some potatoes. Grandma, why did it take so long? Seeing the coke I placed on the table, Sam asked with a look of unease. 
I got a bit lost choosing your favorite juice. Sam quickly changed his expression to a bright one. I love Coke, he said and gulped down the melon soda. Despite being only five years old, he waited quietly at the diner at this late hour, showing a maturity beyond his years. Why does such a sweet child have to face such hardship? I wondered to myself as I watched Sam eat his potatoes. After Sam finished his potatoes, he became restless. What should we do? Do you want to order a hamburger too? I suggested kindly. Maybe we should head home soon. I might get in trouble. Sam said with a look of worry on his face. I was thinking about how to explain that we couldn't go home just yet. In the midst of this, a woman entered the diner. I waved at her, and she quickly made her way to our table. Who is that? Sam looked puzzled as he stared at the stranger. However, the woman couldn't contain her tears and embraced Sam tightly. She was Jessica, Sam's biological mother, whom I had called on the phone. Mom, is it really you? Sam showed a mix of surprise and joy. Gazing into her face, he seemed to be slowly piecing together his memories. John and Jessica had divorced when Sam was just two, and three years had passed since then. During that time, Sam had kept the memory of his mother in his heart. Initially, after coming to our home, Sam often reminisced about his mother. But it wasn't just Sam. Jessica also seemed to have never forgotten Sam for a moment. Waiting for the two to calm their tears, I recounted the recent events to Jessica. I told her about Tina's harsh treatment of Sam, how he was locked in the shed over spilled milk, and today, at Anna's birthday party, he was told he wasn't family. I'm truly sorry. I should have been more vigilant. No, Nancy, you shouldn't be apologizing. I'm grateful you've been protecting Sam and that you called me here. I had hesitated to call Jessica because John had told me they divorced due to her infidelity. However, meeting her changed my impression of her. Jessica, you are Sam's biological mother, but did I cause you trouble by calling you here out of the blue? You might have a new partner or other family matters, right? Jessica revealed her emotions. I don't have anyone else. Sam was all that mattered to me. Jessica's words contradicted the story I had heard from John about their divorce. When I told her this, Jessica was shocked, then began to share her side of the story. Actually, it was John and Tina who were having an affair. While talking, Jessica looked sadly at Sam, who was asleep, and began to quietly tell the truth about those times. Since Sam's birth, John and Tina had started their relationship, and this was a shocking revelation to Jessica. One day, a man claiming to be a lawyer appeared and presented papers with false claims that Jessica had an affair and abandoned Sam, pressing her for a divorce from John. These accusations were baseless for Jessica, an unbelievable turn of events. With her parents already deceased and distant from friends, she had no one to turn to. Focused on caring for baby Sam, she rarely went out, and her interactions with neighbors were only superficial. Under these circumstances, it was extremely difficult for her to refute the allegations against her, she explained. Listening to her, I felt an overwhelming sense of despair. You could have come to me for advice. But at that time, the shock of John's betrayal was too much, and I was even suspicious of you. Jessica's apologetic words pained me. I felt shame and remorse for what my son had caused. I regretted not contacting Jessica sooner. I couldn't hide my indignation. I'm really sorry. So, how are you managing with the child support now? Yes, there was a small inheritance from my parents. Plus, I went back to the job I had before getting married. I'm managing to continue paying child support for Sam's sake. Hearing this, I was at a loss for words. 
Jessica had been enduring such struggles without my knowledge. I lived in ignorance, peacefully with John and his family. I don't even know how to apologize. It's okay, Nancy. You've done nothing wrong. Just being able to see Sam again is reward enough for me. Jessica's expression was calm and full of gratitude. By the way, John has custody of Sam, but haven't you seen him at all? I confronted her with the question that had been nagging at me. Jessica's expression clouded over. It seemed my suspicion was confirmed. Since the divorce, I haven't been able to see Sam at all until today. Her voice trembled with this admission. Knowing this fact, my anger was uncontainable. Jessica, I've made up my mind. The real parent for Sam is not that couple, but you alone. I won't let them take Sam away from you again. Jessica was surprised by my words. Then she seemed to understand my resolve and nodded firmly. Actually, I haven't just been sitting on my hands either. She revealed that she had already taken legal action. Her lawyer was preparing to claim the unjustly demanded child support and damages from John and Tina. Furthermore, according to Jessica's lawyer, the lawyer John and Tina had used turned out to be just a friend without any legal qualifications. I will support you. With that declaration, we pledged our cooperation in the late night diner. Three months had passed and I continued my usual life pretending to know nothing. But I was always carefully watching over Sam. One day, Jessica and her lawyer came to our house. I settled the surprise John and Tina and seated them. What brings you here today? Tina asked, a hint of challenge in her panicked voice. We've come to discuss a claim for damages and transferring Sam's custody to me. Jessica responded with composure. Damages? That concerns you, doesn't it? I have heard about you from John. Tina counted, as if accusing Jessica. Indeed, since you were John's mistress. What nonsense are you talking about? I met John only after your divorce. John remained silent, just observing. John, are you just going to listen silently? Speak the truth. John still only listened silently to the argument between the two women. Let's calm down for a moment, everyone. Let's hear what our lawyer has to say. I continued to act unaware of John's circumstances and allow Jessica's lawyer to speak. First, please look at these documents. The lawyer presented the report from the fake lawyer John and Tina had used. This report was submitted by the person acting as John's representative during his divorce from Jessica. What significance does that old document have now? Tina was clearly agitated. What's the problem with it? I was supposed to have hired a proper lawyer. As John started to make excuses, Jessica's lawyer interjected. Is that lawyer actually a lawyer? And which law firm are they affiliated with? Uh, well. John was at a loss for words. Ignoring him, Jessica's lawyer calmly pointed out the facts. This report is questionable even to a professional's eye. The photos are highly likely to be fabricated, and the testimonies claiming Jessica abandoned her child care are too vague. But based on that evidence, Jessica divorced John, right? Tina desperately tried to justify herself. Indeed. Jessica was pressured into divorce by the circumstances at the time. However, the amount of child support is excessive, and why hasn't she been allowed to see her child even once despite paying it? That's because Sam says he doesn't want to see her. Inside, I was screaming that couldn't be true. When Sam came to our home, how much he yearned for his mother. My anger was mounting. But it's a fact that Jessica abandoned her childcare, isn't it? Even if the testimonies are ambiguous, they were gathered, after all. Tina continued to speak with a temporarily composed demeanor. Would you like to see the child care diary I kept? Saying this, Jessica pulled out a well-used B5 size notebook. On its cover was written Sam's child care diary. 
such things can easily be written later on, can't they? However, when Jessica silently opened the notebook, Tina's complexion changed dramatically. The notebook contained detailed child care records, their authenticity silencing Tina. It was filled with meticulous notes on Sam's child care. Dates, weekdays, feeding times, diaper changing details, sleep patterns, and at the end of each day, Jessica's own feelings were written down. Between the pages, heartfelt messages to Sam were also scattered. Tina, being a mother herself, should have been able to understand the depth of love that went into these notes. Jessica, managing childcare alone, had kept such comprehensive records. Would someone who abandoned their child keep such a detailed childcare diary? Speechless, Tina and a puzzled John could only listen. The kind of commitment found in the diary was beyond the comprehension of someone without childcare experience. This diary also contains descriptions of John's actions about me. John appeared tired. It includes notes on when you return home late and your business trips. Jessica recounted John's activities matter-of-factly. Still, you can't prove infidelity just from the contents of a diary. Tina seemed temporarily relieved. True, a diary alone might not suffice as evidence. That's right. That was the hard part. Tina looked at Jessica with a sense of triumph, but her face turned pale as if she realized something the next moment. I had kept the credit card statements of John. After we divorced, I found them ticked away in my household ledger. Silent and without a retort, Tina and John could only listen. Regarding the days John claimed to be on business trips and didn't come home, those dates on the card statements list the names of restaurant. Ignoring the silent pair, Jessica spoke calmly. On the same dates, pictures appeared on a certain woman's social media. The hashtags included the restaurant's name and the word secret. What's that supposed to mean? Such a coincidence. Tina was desperate to refute. Yes, but in those photos, that woman is emphasizing a certain belonging. Jessica continued with calm persistence. This watch in the picture, that's John's, isn't it? Tina and John wore expressions of shock. Watches like that are common, aren't they? Tina still seemed to be resisting the implication. That is, the pair watch we gave Jessica and John as a wedding gift, custom made and one of a kind. I explained the situation matter of factly. That, that can't be. Tina was at a loss for words, and silence filled the room. Enough already. John said with a voice filled with void. Jessica nodded to her lawyer, signaling to proceed. We thank the defendant for his confession. With this, we can proceed directly to settlement negotiations rather than mediation. I haven't admitted to anything. Go ahead, take it to court. Tina shook with anger, yet the lawyer maintained composure and continued. Let's also address the issue with the report from the alleged lawyer previously. Fortunately, we've already obtained a detailed account from this so-called lawyer. That person has. Surprise and confusion spread across Tina's face. It was revealed that the fake lawyer was actually Tina's friend and former lover. It also came to light that he had been receiving a portion of the alimony and child support meant for Jessica. After discussing the potential charge of forgery of private documents, he confessed to everything. Tina seemed to have no more energy to argue. At that moment, from a gap in the sliding door, Sam's voice was heard. Mom, what's happening? It's nothing. Everything is okay. Jessica's voice was clear and filled with relief. Come on, let's go home, to our new place. A new life with Sam awaits us. Eventually, the court case proceeded, and the outcome for John and Tina was clear-cut. Custody of Sam was awarded to Jessica, and John and Tina were legally found guilty for their actions. They were also ordered to return the unjust alimony and child support, and to pay damages to Jessica. This case became a significant event, 
even making it into the news. Triggered by this affair, John and Tina ended up blaming each other, resulting in their divorce. Tina was disowned by her own family, and it seems Anna was taken in by her grandparents. I hear Tina is struggling with debt and misfortune, but it's a consequence of her own actions. Naturally, I have severed ties with John and am now enjoying my own life. Payments for child support to Jessica appear to be continuing, but I have no interest in John's whereabouts. Meanwhile, Jessica had started a new life. She occasionally brought Sam to visit my house. We are now like friends. She seems to have built a good relationship with the lawyer she met during the trial. And I sometimes give them advice about their relationship. It seems Sam also likes the lawyer. One day, while Jessica was seeking advice about her love life, Sam suddenly said this. Mom, I love seeing you smile. When you and that man are together, I have a lot of fun too. A year had passed since then, and today was the day Jessica and Sam were visiting. Unable to wait, I went down to the apartment's entrance to greet them. Soon, I could see the two of them walking hand in hand. Sam was considerately walking beside Jessica. Sam has really grown into such a kind child. Nancy, you came all the way down to meet us. Thank you. Of course, I was looking forward to seeing you both. And well, while helping Jessica with her luggage, I glanced at her swelling belly. You're not alone anymore. I can't wait to meet the new baby. Dad's really looking forward to it, too. Seeing their happy faces filled my heart with warmth. The gentle spring sunshine bathed everything outside. 